like many young Jews in the Western world in the 1930s, I lived in two worlds. There was the tranquil world as a Cambridge graduate engaged in teaching and research, a leader in Cambridge Union debates. This was a world that would soon vanish. And there was the world of Jewish anguish. The last pre-war Zionist Congress assembled at Geneva in August 1939. I was present at the age of 24, accompanying the Zionist president, Chaim Weizmann, whom I revered as my leader and mentor. I shall never forget August the 24th, when news reached at the Zionist Congress of the pact between Foreign Minister Molotov and Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop. War was now an imminent certainty. The despair of Chaim Weizmann, David Ben-Gurion, and Moshe Charet seems to cry out through the silent camera lens. Adolf Hitler's monstrous design for the Jews became clear after the night of November the 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Soon after, Hitler spoke for the first time in public about the extermination of European Jewry. The members of the Nazi party and the Hitler youth embraced Hitler's anti-Semitism with fervor. At first, the brutality was sporadic. It was only later that the campaign for total annihilation became a centrally organized nightmare. of Europe were doomed. Adolf Hitler had already begun his conquest of continental Europe. In March 1938, he had absorbed Austria into the German Reich. In September, he invaded Czechoslovakia. Would complete destruction by the Luftwaffe unless the nation surrendered itself unconditionally to Germany's protection. Before dawn on September the 1st, 1939, the German army invaded Poland. Britain and France declared war. Two weeks later, the Soviet army occupied half of Poland. By the end of the month, Poland was a bleeding corpse. It was the Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. After Poland, Hitler turned his armies to the West and in the Lightning War occupied all of Western Europe, culminating in his conquest of Paris. North Africa, the tide turned against the British when the German army arrived with powerful new weapons commanded by the brilliant tactician General Erwin Rommel. June the 20th, Rommel makes his final attack. charge in from all directions. In 24 hours, Tobruk surrenders.
There was nothing now to prevent the Germans from pushing all the way to Egypt, and beyond Egypt lay the defenseless Jewish homeland. After the disgrace and the collapse of British garrisons in Tobruk, Winston Churchill resolved that henceforth the Germans would pay a heavy price for making any new conquests, and in the macabre contingency that Palestine would be captured by the Germans, not such a fantastic idea when you realize how near they were, the Jews of Palestine could be relied upon to offer maximum resistance. It was this that brought me to the land of Israel for the first time. My first arrival in the land of Israel was in a very strange context. It began, as most stories did, in the Second World War with Winston Churchill. The plan was that uh, the British army or the British intelligence would arm and finance and support the Haganah, in which hundreds of young Israelis would be taught how to blow up uh, railways, how to destroy bridges, uh, how to assassinate the German leaders. But if there was to be cooperation between the Haganah and the British, who was to be the link between them? Well, here was a British officer named the Major Eban, who could command equal confidence uh, from the Zionist leadership and fidelity, of course, to his uh, uh, duty as a British officer. I therefore left Cairo on a train from Cairo to Kantara to Rehovot. I entered the land of Israel in a rhapsodical mood. When I came to Rehovot and I smelled the orange blossoms and I saw the Hebrew writing Rehovot on the signpost, I knew that I had entered Hebrew country for the first time. underground resistance, the Palmach, had already been trained and financed by the British government, which in all other domains was an adversary of the Zionist movement, and hundreds, perhaps thousands of young Jews would be trained in guerrilla warfare. This Israeli generation belonged to a different world than that of their fathers. Their image of themselves was as clear as the summer sun and just as uncomplicated. From the beginning, the Jews of Palestine longed to fight the Nazis under their own flag. The Jews saw the Nazis as their most hated enemies. While the Arabs generally supported the Nazis. Allegiance of the Arab nationalist and religious leader Hajj Amin al Husseini of Jerusalem became blatant. There was a certain logic to it. Anwar Sadat explains. It was very simple for us. Germany is the enemy of our enemy, England. So the enemy of our enemy is our friend. In July 1942, soon after the Battle of Tobruk, the German tide in North Africa was reversed by the Battle of El Alamein. Without this British victory, the gas chambers and death camps would have sealed the fate of Palestine's Jews. The Battle of El Alamein lasted 12 days. The British had lost 13,500 men, but the Germans were in full retreat. The German dream of conquering Africa and thus opening the gate to the Middle East had been smashed. General Montgomery had crushed Hitler's armies. In the spring of 1944, Churchill ordered the formation of a Jewish brigade. He declared 
it seems to me indeed appropriate that a special Jewish unit of that race which has suffered indescribable torment from the Nazis should be represented as a distinct formation among the forces gathered for their final overthrow. The Jewish Brigade Group saw its first action in the rugged terrain of Italy as part of the British Eighth Army. On April the 9th, 1945, the Jewish Brigade joined troops from the United States, Britain, and five other Allied countries in an assault on the German lines. They acquitted themselves with honor. had gone into action just in time. Far to the north, the last battle of the war was ending. The Russians occupied a devastated Berlin. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. No period of rejoicing for the Jews. For the Western Allies, it was a deliverance. The material cost had been enormous, and they had sacrificed a million of their people, but they had won the victory, and they could move toward a brighter future. For the Jews, it was different. The end of the war was only the lifting of the veil that had disguised their agony. It was the lowest ebb in the fortunes of the Jews throughout all their long history. The effects of the Holocaust were now starkly visible and the spectacle went beyond our worst terror-stricken apprehension. To the Nazi murder mill at Ordurf comes General Eisenhower with Generals Bradley and Patton. Shocked by unbelievable atrocities, the Supreme Allied Commander demands that all the world witness this German bestiality. So frightful that the strongest are sickened by this irrefutable proof filmed by the U.S. Signal Corps cameramen. By trucks to this scene of organized death and terror are brought well-fed burghers and German officers. On orders of General Eisenhower, they're forced to look upon the evidence of indescribable human degradation. One of the camp commanders balks at returning to the scene of his crimes, but the American MPs mean business. For Germans, this is required sightseeing. At the end of the war in the West revealed tragic conditions in Central Europe. Vast numbers of slave laborers were now free of their German captors. There were also many survivors of the death camps and the concentration camps, still wearing the striped uniforms that were all that they possessed. They comprised a huge homeless population of displaced persons. They were temporarily housed in camps sometimes the very camps that had been their prisons. Now the Jews were more determined than ever before to win a homeland, a place where any Jew could come and be safe from hatred and persecution. They counted heavily on the British pre-war promise. The Zionists looked for friendly support from Churchill, running in the 1945 election in Britain. He got the cheers, but the opposition party got the votes, and Churchill resigns. In 1945, with war's end, the British Labour Party, committed to a liberal immigration policy in Palestine, was swept into power, and a new cabinet was formed, headed by the sincere and progressive Clement Attlee. Herbert 
Morrison, who is slated for an important post in the Labor Cabinet, as is Ernest Bevan. Quickly, the London spokesman for the Arab states warned Britain's new government that the Labor Party's policy was not acceptable to the Arabs. Every Jew that arrives in Palestine is one more brick in the structure of the proposed Zionist state, one more unit towards the Zionist majority against the Arabs, <coughs> so that it is impossible for the Arabs to regard the matter only in its humanitarian aspect. The political question was finally settled by the White Paper, and any attempt to force more refugees on Palestine now, <coughs> on whatever grounds it is ostensibly made, would be a breach of that settlement. A prompt answer came from Professor Harold J. Lasky, chairman of the Labour Party and semi-official advisor to Great Britain's new government. The Labour government must make sure that pan-Arabism, so carefully cultivated since 1939, understands decisively that the tragic remnant of European Jewry will not be sacrificed to make a holiday for Arab landlords in the Middle East. The British Foreign Minister from 1945 onward was Ernest Bevin, who had a very one-sided and prejudiced approach uh, to uh, Israel's struggle for independence. Very hard man to deal with. Uh, of Ernest Bevin, I would say that um, underneath his abrasive exterior, there lurked an abrasive interior. Among the unnumbered millions of Europeans who must endure a terrible winter of famine and cold, are some million and a half Jews, all that remain from pre-war Europe's eight million. Those Jews who have kept their lives have kept little else save the hope of escape from the scenes of their torment. But for most of them, escape from intolerance and privation is at present impossible. To help these refugees, Delegates of the World Zionist Conference met in London in the late summer of 1945. They urged the British government to create a Jewish state in Palestine and remove restrictions on immigration to the Holy Land. To this end, the delegates appealed for the full moral and material support of the United Nations. For Palestine is to surviving European Jews almost unattainable. Only a few thousand Jews escaped from war-ravaged Europe in 1945 to find sanctuary in Palestine. Those who have set foot on Palestinian soil have benefited from an already smoothly functioning organization capable of handling many more refugees than immigration restrictions allow. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land, and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. But in 1939, Great Britain was faced with war, and at Haifa in Palestine was the terminus of an oil pipeline from Iraq. Overnight, the Middle East became a vital strategic area, through it ran the Suez Canal, Britain's lifeline to the Far East. Peace had to be maintained in the Arab states so that Great Britain would be assured of an oil supply to fuel her planes and tanks and ships in the coming battle. To calm the Arab world, London produced in 1939 a white paper which strictly limited immigration into Palestine. Many fair-minded men and women found this policy a relic of the days of appeasement, and throughout the war it was under attack from many sides. The great issue after the war was whether the gates of Palestine would be open, no longer alas to the mass of European Jews, at least to the survivors of the Holocaust, and to our astonishment, and I think to the world's horror, especially to President Truman's horror, the British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin continued to keep that gate closed. It was my attitude that the American government couldn't stand idly by while the victims of Hitler's madness 
were not allowed to build new lives. Some way had to be found to take care of those displaced persons, give them a place to live, something to eat and something to wear. And it was up to us to try to get it done. Ernest Bevin even rejected President Truman's appeal to allow a hundred thousand Holocaust survivors to find a home in Palestine. Instead, he urged the Jews to look for their salvation to Central Europe, their former torture chamber and graveyard. Getting Jewish sufferings under the Nazis, British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin said, the Jews have waited 2,000 years for a homeland. A little more time shouldn't matter. That is a pretty raw, ignominious thing to say. When Bevin made that statement to me, and he added to it, Another statement that if I had not meddled with the thing, they would have had the thing settled. So that didn't help my Missouri good nature one little bit. The British economy was in a disastrous condition. British policy in the Middle East in 1945 was driven by two imperatives. The first was to protect the supply of oil from Iraq and the small Arab Emirates of the Persian Gulf. The second was to preserve control of the Suez Canal. If these calculations had no meaning for the Jews, they took to the roads, carrying with them what little they still possessed. They were straining every nerve and sinew to get to Palestine. This vast migration of survivors was organized without reference to the occupying American and British armies. The Jewish Brigade devoted all its efforts to rescuing its fellow Jews. In addition to providing physical support, the Zionist authorities became adept at supplying forged documents for presentation at frontier posts. The British allowed only 13,000 refugees a year into Palestine. Beyond that number, all who tried to penetrate the blockade were arrested. Jews who had already suffered the constant threat of death were now made to endure an additional period of uncertainty and danger. They had to cover hundreds of miles on foot. It taxed the last of their strength. For those who finally reached the railhead, a different ordeal began, a clandestine journey into Israel. Crammed into tiny hiding places on crowded slave ships, they began a frightening odyssey. The British had established a vigilant blockade in the Mediterranean against Jewish immigration. Their planes and warships were on patrol, seeking the refugee ships that disguised themselves as ordinary freighters. Almost always, the refugees were discovered. They showed impassioned resistance. Those who did not have permits to enter Palestine were immediately re-embarked at Haifa and were sent to a detention camp in Cyprus. Their only brief contact with their national home was the Haifa Quayside. Their only sight of their homeland was blocked by barbed wire and barricades. There was a worldwide surge of humane compassion for these people who, after being battered by Nazi cruelty and having traveled all this way seeking new homes in the Promised Land, were refused entry. There were three Jewish resistance groups actively engaged in Palestine Two of the smaller groups, the Irgun and Lehi, were already operating against the British. 
Their posters called for rebellion. In a decisive move, David Ben Gurion now ordered Haganah, by far the largest Zionist underground movement, to lead the resistance under a united command. They were to attack British communication systems and military installations. In a single night, they destroyed 11 strategic bridges. Palestine Jewry was now in full and open revolt. The accelerated violence attracted the world's attention. Haifa Harbor, Palestine. An oil fire, admittedly started by terrorists, the so-called Stern Gang, rages along a quarter mile of waterfront. The timing of the explosions was allegedly to divert British attention away from a refugee ship making for port under cover of darkness. The 100,000 British soldiers in Palestine were tense. They resented the tasks that they were told to perform long after the end of the war when they had expected to be home. World spotlight on Jerusalem's King David Hotel, British Army headquarters in Palestine. Shown here before it was blown up by Jewish extremists, today the luxurious Near East Hotel is in ruins. A 60-foot gap in the building, extending from cellar to roof, was blasted by two explosions of landmines. The mines were placed in the basement, apparently by a band of Jewish terrorists disguised as Arabs. 29 are missing, 76 are dead. Among the casualties are high British officials, as well as Jews and Arabs. Condemned by President Truman as an act of terrorism, and by Jewish agency officials in Palestine as a dastardly crime, the explosion brings the Palestine crisis to new waves of... British reaction was fierce. They arrested the Zionist leaders, imposed curfews, and made the possession of weapons punishable by death. The troops were ordered to shoot to kill. The British had assumed the power of life and death in Palestine. In July 1947, the British executed three members of the Irgun. In retaliation, the Irgun hanged two British hostages in an orange grove. The British search for the Irgun included a search for Menachem Begin. The British were expending great effort to control the violence in Palestine, but all to no avail. It was then that I made my decision to abandon other careers and to accept the request of Moshe Charette to join the embattled Zionist leaders in their hour of crisis. I need hardly tell you how much his Majesty's government deplore the state of unrest and disturbance into which Palestine has been plunged. Mr. Bevin directed the British representative to the United Nations to announce Britain's decision to withdraw from After Palestine. years of strenuous but unavailing effort, His Majesty's government have reached the conclusion that they are not able to bring about a settlement in Palestine based upon the consent of both Arabs and Jews. It is for this reason that they have brought the problem before the United Nations, hoping that the General Assembly would be more successful in the search for an agreed settlement. By mid-May 1947, not a single government in the United Nations had come out clearly in favor of the establishment of a Jewish state. It was then that we heard a stunning suggestion, and from whom should it come but Andrei Gromyko. Elementarnych prav jevrejskoho naroda objasnjajet stremlenje jevrejev k sazdanju svojevo gosudarstva. The suggestion was that Palestine be partitioned between a Jewish and an Arab state. That was the first moment at which I could predict a success in the United Nations debate. In May 1947, the United Nations set up a special committee on Palestine. It really was a, a turning point. Now, if uh, that commission had not recommended Jewish statehood, we would have had no chance whatever 
of securing a resolution for a Jewish state in the General Assembly. It was very impressive that the 11 men, who were by no means the central luminaries in their governments, none of whom had any experience in making uh, drastic historic decisions, all came to the conclusion that the British mandate had to end. It invited the Arabs and the Jews each to appoint two liaison officers. The Arabs contemptuously refused to nominate their liaison officers. It was one of their greatest mistakes. Their refusal gave me and my colleague David Horowitz an open field. In diplomacy, one gains more by the folly of adversaries than from one's own wisdom. The most striking appeal to the United Nations Committee was made by Chaim Weizmann. We realize that uh, we cannot have the whole of Palestine. God may have promised Palestine to the Jew. It is up to the Almighty to keep his promise in his own time. Our business is to do what we can in a very imperfect human way. As one of the Zionist liaison officers, my job was to encourage the UN Committee to see our work and to understand our hopes. A ship of so-called illegal immigrants was brought into Haifa. I persuaded the chairman, Dr. Sundstrom of Sweden, and a colleague of his to witness the scene. The ship arrived in Haifa Harbor with 4,000 refugees from the German slaughterhouse on board. They came with tragic memories and with a shining hope. They were met by British soldiers who arrested them, put them in cages on a British ship, and dragged them away screaming. The cages had a traumatic effect on the members of the UN Committee. When they left Haifa, they came back pale and shocked. Now, that one incident made many people understand that if that's the only way that the British mandate could work, it had better not continue at all. Mr. Bevin ordered the ship back to Hamburg. The desperate passengers from Exodus were back where they had begun, at a refugee camp in Germany, where they could be watched from guard towers. It was as though the film of their lives was running backward. In July and August 1947, I was at Geneva with the United Nations Committee. They were feverish but exhilarating days. We spent countless hours lobbying the committee to recommend a Jewish state. If we failed, the Zionist condition would be bleak. At midnight on the 1st of September, I was handed the report of the United Nations Special Committee. It called for the establishment of a Jewish state, but would this be confirmed by the United Nations General the Assembly? The Palestine cannot go into any political discussion on the basis of any Jewish state in Palestine. Немногое сказать в дополнение к тому, что было сказано в начале. The record of pioneering achievement of the Jewish people in Palestine has received the acclaim of the entire world. Are the Arabs responsible for that problem? <coughs> Have they acted or worked or helped in creating such a problem? Certainly the question, no. The United States delegation supports the basic principles of the unanimous recommendations and the majority plan which provides for petition and immigration. My government have consequently decided to lay down the mandate and intend to complete the withdrawal of British forces from Palestine by the 1st of August, 1948. There was breathtaking suspense as the day for the United Nations vote drew near. We scattered to our hotels and made telephone calls all over the world rallying support. I witnessed a demonstration in actual political science in action. The pressure politics that was applied, the economic promises and persuasions, the propaganda, the breathing down the throats of the delegates. To the Jewish people, politics was not a gamble. It was a science. 
the history of Israeli diplomacy is a history of, of cliffhangers. There's never been a case where our victory was assured. If we lost, we'd have been worse off than before. It's one thing not to have Jewish statehood confirmed, but to have Jewish statehood rejected is a much worse condition. Afghanistan? No. Argentina? Argentina? Abstention? Ethiopia? Abstain? France? Yes? I am confident on the way you will behave in a so serious decision taken by this assembly, because I am decided not to allow anybody to interfere in our decision. South Africa? Yes. Soviet Union? Yes. United Kingdom? Abstain? Yes. The United States? Venezuela? Yes. Yes. Yemen? No. Yugoslavia? Abstain. The resolution of the Duck Committee on Palestine was adopted by 33 votes. Six months from now, in May 1948, the British mandate will end, and 50 years after Herzl, it will no longer be a dream. The Arabs of Palestine violently opposed to the United Nations plan launched a full-scale insurrection. They had threatened that the partitioned line would be nothing but a line of blood and fire. The brunt of the Arab attacks fell on civilians. Curfews and British military action could not end the violence. joyous celebration of the November 1947 resolution was understandable, but the question was, would our strength suffice to convert that resolution into reality? The first effort of the Jewish forces was to retain the 33 settlements, which under the partition map would have been swallowed by the Arab state. These places were turned into fortified camps. Vigilance was constant. The settlers turned their agricultural machines into weapons of defense, seeking security deep in the earth. They dug in for protection against the bombardment which they expected. They built and supplied entire underground complexes, even including small hospitals. There was only one road between Jerusalem and the coast. The life of Jerusalem depended on a single thread. Since the Arabs held the high ground and commanded the roads, the Jews had to build their own armored vehicles in order to try to break through. On January the 17th, 35 young men of the Palmach were ambushed outside Jerusalem. Their bodies were savagely mutilated. There were atrocities by both sides. The Irgun carried out a massacre of the Arab villages of Deir Yassin. One of the more callous acts by the Arab irregulars 
was the annihilation of a convoy of doctors and nurses from the Handassa Medical Center. The Arabs attacked Jewish quarters in the cities. In March 1948, prominent military strategists, including Field Marshal Montgomery, Secretary of State George Marshall, and Secretary of Defense Forrestal, were saying that the Jews would not be able to survive the imminent assault by the Arab regular armies. I remember one time talking to James Forrestal, who was Secretary of Defense, and he said, uh, Clark, you just don't understand this. It's a question of arithmetic. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there are 45 million Arabs and 350,000 Jews. And the 45 million Arabs are going to push the 350,000 Jews right into the ocean. So he said, that's all there is to it. Outside of the White House, Jewish supporters demonstrated. They feared that the United States was going to abandon partition and to support foreign rule under United Nations trusteeship. It was vital to get President Truman to hold fast to the partition scheme. Dr. Cham Weitzman had been trying to get in all along, and I wouldn't let him in. But someone did come to see me, and he got in. This man with whom I was in business was Eddie Jacobson, one of the finest men I ever had anything to do with. He came in, he stood around, didn't say very much, was as quiet as he could be, and I finally said, Eddie, what in the world's the matter with you? Have you at last come to get something? Well, because you never have asked me for anything since I've been in the White House and since we've been friends. And then he told me that he thought that I ought not to keep Dr. Weitzman out of the White House. He thought I ought to see him. And I told him that I would see the doctor, but he'd have to bring him in the side door. I didn't want any propaganda started on the thing. Dr. Weitzman's first name was C-H-A-I-M. And I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I called him Cham. Called him that to his face, and he liked it. He was a wonderful man, one of the wisest people I think I ever met. We had a long, long conversation. And he explained the situation from his viewpoint. And I listened to him very carefully. And at the same time, I sent for Eddie Jacobson, and they both sat down and talked to me for a long, long time. When we were through, I said, all right. You two Jews have put it over on me, and I'm glad you have. After President Truman's meeting with Weizmann, the UN Security Council convened with trusteeship still on the agenda. We believe that a trust temporary trusteeship for Palestine should be established under the trusteeship council of the United Nations. The uh, speech that uh Ambassador Austin made at the UN came as a great surprise to President Truman. He was against the Jewish program almost entirely. And I called him up at the United Nations and told him exactly what I wanted and, I, and uh, explained the whole situation to him. After he knew what all the facts were, that was the right thing to do. He said, well, Mr. President, if you want it, I'll do everything I can to put it over. April was Ben-Gurion's finest hour. He ordered the Haganah to abandon mere defense and to smash through to beleaguered Jerusalem. Rifles and light machine guns began to arrive from Czechoslovakia. In April, most of Haifa's 70,000 Arabs, alarmed by the intensification of hostilities, fled to neighboring Lebanon. The British withdrawal proceeded as planned. Families and dependents were leaving for Britain even while Palestine was in the grip of martial law. The heavy equipment and the massive troops that the British would have needed for a prolonged occupation were shipped elsewhere. They were not unhappy to be leaving. The first rumblings for a major battle for Jerusalem followed the systematic British withdrawals from the Holy City. As the British soldiers evacuated their military encampment, 
Jews and Arabs massed their troops and jockeyed for position around Jerusalem. The British mandate was to end at 6 p.m. New York time on May the 14th. Early in the morning, the Union Jack was lowered over Government House. The last High Commissioner, General Sir Alan Cunningham, bade farewell to Palestine with a dignified salute. British rule had lasted for 30 years. It had begun on an exalted note, had left a solid reality behind, but had ended in frustration and dejection. The Arabs were quick to move into the vacuum. By midday, the Egyptians had advanced deep into the Negev. A strong Iraqi column had reached the River Jordan. The Jordanian Legion had established itself all along the river. A Syrian brigade was assembling on the upper reaches of the Jordan. The Arab intention was to strangle Israel's statehood at the moment of its birth. It was tense in Tel Aviv on May the 14th, 1948. It was a day of which all future Jewish generations would never cease to speak and dream, the day of Israel's birth. Undaunted by the ominous reports of the massing of the enemy armies, the 37 founding fathers, with David Ben-Gurion at their head, gathered in the Museum of Tel Aviv to make a decision that would resound forever in Jewish history. And meanwhile, at the UN, it was very important for us to prevent the General Assembly from taking a decision before 6 o'clock which might preempt our declaration of independence. At the United Nations, the Arab states are making a last-ditch attempt to force a resolution that will stop the creation of the Jewish state. If by 6 o'clock we cannot arrive into, at any conclusion, the whole game is up. In Tel Aviv, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, one hour before the Sabbath. Do we need to so happy this shall am a In the midst of diplomacy at the UN and the rumbling of imminent war in the Near East, the fate of the Jewish nation now lies in the hands of President Truman. United States recognition of the State of Israel is the Jewish nation's only hope for independence. At 11 minutes past six, Ambassador Philip Jessup of the United States delegation rose to the rostrum. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. The long Jewish exile had ended. But at 5 o'clock in the morning, Tel Aviv was bombed by Egyptian aircraft. Israel's defenders had no illusions about the perils that they would face. Israel knew the fear of death and the taste of birth in the same moment. There was a sense of high occasion. The applause was fervent. In the uh, modern history of Israel, we've uh, lived a kind of a process of fluctuation. 
uh, passing from a mood of uh, celebration uh, to moods of deep anxiety. We established our independence by the declaration of the uh, 14th of May, 1948. But before our celebration had died down, and before the noise of festivities had subsided, there was a bombing of uh, Israel the next morning by Egypt, and Arab forces began to converge upon us. The Arab aim was the extinction of Israel. They would mock the very idea that a Jewish state could arise against the Arab will. Israel, less than one day old, was being attacked not by untrained volunteers, but by the armies of six sovereign Arab states, well-trained and lavishly equipped with British and French weaponry. The combined Arab armies had 35,000 men with modern armor and artillery. The Jewish army, men, women, and high school students who face the Arab onslaught are mainly civilians, poorly equipped, barely trained, using faith and determination against overwhelming odds. Our forces were now engaged on three fronts, in the north against the Syrians and Lebanese, in the center against the Iraqi army and the Transjordanian Arab Legion, and in the south against the formidable Egyptians. But Jerusalem was our greatest source of danger. On May the 18th, the Arab Legion had launched its assault on Jerusalem. It penetrated the old city, a knife thrust at Israel's heart. The fighting was house to house and hand to hand. When the state was declared, I was not on the convoy. I commanded a brigade at fought in the besieged Jerusalem. It was a very bitter fighting. The brigade that I commanded suffered the highest number of casualties than any one of the other 12 brigades of the armed forces of Israel, of the IDF. I didn't think about the meaning of the state. I was completely preoccupied in the fighting in the besieged Jerusalem to prevent the annihilation of 80,000 Jews that were under the siege thirsty for water, starving for food, shelled, fired at by snipers. This was what I thought about. Not what would happen with the state later on. Then we fought for our survival in the real meaning of the word. The uh, teenagers, between the ages of 12 and 14, were recruited to the Gadna, to the paramilitary service, and they performed functions of messengers carrying notes, and carrying uh, ammunition. Some of them were hurt, were wounded, severely wounded. One of them uh, lost uh, his leg. They not only showed the bravery, they were actually better functioning than any grown-up could do. On May the 28th, in Jerusalem, with only 300 rounds of ammunition left and only 36 fighting men still in action, the defenders of the old city had to surrender. Arabs looted the Jewish quarter, destroying dozens of synagogues in their wild rampage. Fewer than 1,200 civilians made their sad, weary way down the slopes of Mount Zion. Their wounds were tended. The west of Jerusalem fought on with valor against the Arab Legion, whose morale was now high. Its Jewish population was besieged, threatened with famine and thirst, isolated from the main body of the state, and subjected to an inferno of bombardment day and night. When Jerusalem was under siege, we had reached a point which uh, one of our commanders at that time, uh, General Herzog, has uh, portrayed. Its water supplies had been cut off and it was living only on what had been collected in the water cisterns. Uh, everybody was living on one pail of water a day for all purposes, 
and about three slices of bread a day. That's all that was left in the city at the time. It would be impossible to bring water, food, or ammunition into Jerusalem unless the heights commanding the approaches to the city from the coast could be captured by the Palmach troops. The Palmach attacked Castel across seemingly impassable hills and rocks. Ben Gurion was implacable in demanding this costly effort. It was decided to try to seize Latrun, formerly a British police stronghold where the Arab Legion was entrenched. We were thrown into battle at Latrun in order to try to open the road to Jerusalem. Even though the forces in which I personally participated, such as the 7th Brigade, were not ready to go into battle. They had not been trained, they didn't know each other. Some of them had just come off the boats as immigrants from Cyprus. Uh, I don't know if they really knew how to handle a rifle or not. These untrained troops were thrown into the inferno, attacking, retreating, attacking again and again, Despite their gallantry in carrying out a difficult order, they failed to break through. After the fall of the old city, Israel had to absorb another defeat. We didn't succeed. Ben-Gurion was very heavily criticized for this decision. But while Jerusalem was our main anxiety, we were heavily engaged in resisting dangerous enemy pressures in the north and in the south. In the north, the focus of our disquiet was Deganya, known as the Mother of the Kibbutz Movement, founded in 1910. It was a powerful symbol for all Israelis. The Syrians had attacked at dawn on May the 20th with heavy artillery fire. Syrian tanks broke through Deganya's defenses and were set afire by Molotov cocktails thrown by the Kibbutzniks at short range. For four days, the farmers of Kibbutz de Ganya fought repeated Syrian armored attacks, destroyed tanks using Molotov cocktails, and hold the northern front. While de Ganya and Jerusalem were in deadly hazard, there was a third point of peril in the south. The Egyptians were advancing relentlessly along the coast. Their proximity to Tel Aviv was alarming. On May the 19th, the Egyptian army had reached the tiny kibbutz of Yad Mordechai, it was reluctantly decided to remove the women and children to safety. There were four separate assaults by the Egyptians in a single day. The Arab aim was the extinction of Israel. In his first speech in the Security Council, Abba Iban asserts Israel's independence. If the Arab states want peace with Israel, they can have it. If they want war, they can have that too. But whether they want peace or war, they can have it only with the independent, sovereign state of Israel. By May the 23rd, the defenders were running short of ammunition. They couldn't hold out. In the dawn of May the 24th, the survivors of Yad Mordechai left their ruined village. Because of the bravery of the settlers on the way, who did not ev evacuate, the Egyptians advanced very hesitantly. The Egyptians advanced nevertheless, and they reached the area of Isdud, which is today the site of the town of Ashdod. The Givati Brigade, which played a major part in blocking the Egyptian army, moved into action. In the early part of June, our forces had been made breathless by the sheer ferocity of their battles. I received a rare phone call from Ben Gurion. I hope to get a Security Council meeting in a few days. The Prime Minister said gravely, not quick enough, it is a matter of hours. A promise of peace for at least four weeks comes to the Holy Land. Jews and Arabs reach a truce that could restore and battle Jerusalem as a free place of worship for three faiths. But the only hope of rescuing West Jerusalem from starvation was by building a road at breakneck speed 
through ostensibly impassable Judean hills. But what we needed more than anything else was a respite in which we could regroup and train and refresh our weary troops. The truce was to come into force on June the 14th. United Nations observers were to see that no movement to anyone's advantage would occur once the truce was in effect. For three days, we strove to bring the New Jerusalem Road to completion. It was a desperate race against time. With one hour left, the race was won. First free convoy to Jerusalem. Climbing up to Jerusalem early in the morning. We were soldiers and we kissed each other, we hugged each other. It was almost a bless of God. On the first trucks in that first convoy that broke through, there was a Hebrew inscription, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. This was an unbelievable saga of uh, heroism. I don't think that people can even envisage uh, what happened uh, in a completely hopeless situation in which sheer guts combined with leadership and are willing to make the supreme sacrifice by everybody, without exception, finally won the day. There was now a respite, time to honor the dead and to thank the fighting men. The United Nations Security Council had performed a great benefit in enforcing the truce. The truce gave our forces an opportunity to regain strength. Rest and exercise fashioned a more efficient army, trained to the sharpest edge. At the same time, copious quantities of ammunition and equipment were brought in, chiefly from Czechoslovakia. New branches of the service, such as paratroopers, were inaugurated. An air force was born. In the winter of 1948 and 1949, the camps in Cyprus where the British had held thousands of immigrants were emptied, and the internees were finally brought home. Ships from all over the world could now freely carry anyone who wished to join us in the nation's defense. Foreign volunteers under the name of Machal flocked to us from all over the world. Some of the more cherished volunteers had flying experience with the British Royal Air Force. The birth of the Israeli Air Force during this struggle for survival was attended by irony. Cynically as history can be sometimes, we fought for the creation of the Jewish state after 2,000 years in the German Messerschmitt 109, chasing British built Spitfires flown by the Egyptian Air Force mainly. So we got German built airplanes from the communists to fight against British built Spitfires. I took part in one very nice dogfight with the RAF. My belly was going upside down when I saw so many Egyptians so near to Tel Aviv where I was born. A modest naval component was assembled at Haifa and manned by sailors who had seen service in somewhat more formidable fleets. The beach at Tel Aviv becomes a battlefield. In the first serious breach in the new Israeli nation, Irgun extremists clash with the government over a shipload of ammunition. As United Nations observers look on, Irgunists try to unload the American-made LST on the beach. But rather than permit violation of the UN-imposed truce between Jew and Arab, Israeli soldiers fire on the ship and its much-needed cargo. Brother fights brother in the confusion of skirmish along the bloody beach. The ship is fired and the arms and ammunition go up in a series of explosions. Falling debris imperils men escaping from the burning vessel. The forces of order finally prevail as Israel passes its first serious internal crisis. The pain and the scars and the rancor left behind by this event would cut deep into the consciousness of Israel but uh, most historians believe 
that Israeli sovereignty was born on that day. One of the most important results of this grave incident was that all military forces in Israel, including the Palmach, as well as the Irgun and Lefi, now became united in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. There was something suicidal in the Arab decision to renew the fighting on July the 9th against an Israeli army refreshed and replenished by the truth. Israel responded reluctantly but dynamically. In the next 10 days, Egypt lost over 700 killed, 1,000 wounded, and hundreds of prisoners. Facing a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Israelis, the Arab states call for an urgent meeting of the Security Council. It must stop. A vote is taken and the Security Council orders both sides to stop the war in Palestine under pain of economic sanctions and military intervention. There's quick agreement by Prime Minister Ben-Gurion's government of Israel and the truce is accepted by King Abdullah's Transjordania and the other Arab states. During the summer of 1948, the United Nations mediator, Count Volker Bernadotte of Sweden, had been formulating a design for what he called a permanent settlement. He met with Arab and Jewish leaders. In his first plan, he proposed to limit Jewish immigration, to award Jerusalem and the Negev to the Arab state, and to make Haifa a free port. The effrontery of this proposal left us breathless. I said in the United Nations that it was like a surgeon who runs away with his patient's vital organs under the pretense of curing him. It would be charitable to believe that the coincidence of these proposals with Britain's strategic interests was a matter of chance. The Israeli decision was to reject Bernadotte's plan. His end was sudden, unexpected, and tragic. His unrelenting search for a solution ended abruptly and tragically on the afternoon of September 17, 1948. The world was shocked by the news of his assassination in Jerusalem by three members of the Jewish terror underground known as the Stern Gang. United Nations observers were active on all fronts. In the Negev, where Beersheba was still in the hands of the Egyptians, they were at pains to see that no military stores or arms were being illegally transported. At the end of 1948, 11 Jewish settlements in the Negev were still cut off, needing food to survive. When an Israeli relief convoy was attacked, the truce had clearly been broken. The Israeli hold on the Negev was being challenged. Our soldiers responded heavily. Jewish soldiers are rushed into action to reopen blockaded supply routes to their desert settlements. They headed for the Egyptian base at Beersheba. Israeli columns rolling in from the north take the ancient stronghold to command a strategic area along their lifelines to the southern desert. Egyptian war material falls to the victorious Israelis. But the defending soldiers brace themselves for counterattack when warplanes of Egypt strike back at the city. Here, small arms fire is used for protection. takes its toll of dead and wounded. But the Israeli army has gained a signal victory. Egypt's offensive power has been severely crippled, her Palestine bases isolated, and many of her soldiers captured. After a week of warfare, guns are silenced by United Nations action. But after the struggle, Israel's position in the desert land of the Negev is established more firmly than ever before. Only one Egyptian stronghold, Fallujah, was left there. Besieged in it was a young Egyptian captain, Gamal Abdul Nasser. Beyond Fallujah, our victorious forces 
now pressed on across the border into Egypt itself. This was too much for the British, who still had a base in Egypt. They issued an ultimatum, withdraw or we shall force you to withdraw. Ben Gurion agreed, but not before five British planes had been shot down by our Air Force. In the north, there remained the Lebanese army and the more threatening Syrians. The Lebanese refused battle, and by the last day in October, the Syrians had been vanquished. Galilee was firmly in Israeli hands. The Ben Gurion had been probing for an Arab-Israeli peace move, on January the 13th, 1949, negotiations for an armistice began on the island of Rhodes, conducted by the new United Nations mediator, Dr. Ralph Bunch. An agreement was reached six difficult weeks later. It was with Egypt setting the example uh, that the others uh, followed. It is doubtful whether any of the other uh, 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 countries, Lebanon, Jordan, or Syria, would have had the uh, political clout or the political courage uh, to enter into armistice negotiations with us, even at the behest of the Security Council, if Egypt had not set the example. These successful armistice negotiations have demonstrated conclusively the ability of the United Nations to mediate a serious conflict and to avert a dangerous threat to the peace. With United Nations mediation, the young state of Israel and its Arab neighbors conclude an armistice pact, and the victorious Israeli army stages a well-deserved victory parade. The war for the destruction of Israel's independence had some inevitable effects upon the condition of those Arabs who chose to remain and become citizens of Israel. On the one hand, they had juridical equality. Uh, they could elect members to the Knesset. They could, if they wanted, be represented in our parliament at the precise level of their demographic strength. They were equal before the law. On the other hand, their sympathies went out to their kinsmen across the border. But the fact is, there was a very great level and a very great sector of normality in the relationship between Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs. The uh, war that the Arabs launched against Israel created uh, two parallel refugee problems. On the one hand, there was the Arab refugee problem, created as a result of the flight of the Arabs from the consequences of the war which their leaders had launched. And on the other side, there were 800,000 Jews in the Arab countries who became refugees because the hatred that was directed against them in those countries made it impossible for them to remain. What is different, however, is the way in which the two parties related to their refugee problems. Israel treated the Jewish refugees from Arab countries as citizens, as kinsmen, integrated them into the workforce and into the political system, gave them citizenship as soon as they arrived, and took very strong measures in order to ensure their speedy acceptance into our social and uh, economic framework. The Arabs, on the other hand, regarded the refugees as a political opportunity. Uh, they considered and this prediction was borne out, that if they could keep them in squalor and in misery, in a sense of frustration and desperation, so that their plight would cry out to the conscience of the world, they would thereby alienate Israel from world opinion and create pressure for the entry of those refugees into Israel without peace, that is to say in conditions in which their entry would create a time bomb. The issue here is that once you admit that Arab governments launched the war, once you accept the axiom that this refugee problem arose from that war and would not have arisen without it, then you prove by the simplest laws of truth and logic that the Arab governments bear primary responsibility for the creation of this refugee problem. You cannot let loose a war and wash your hands of all responsibility for its tragic consequences. Those Arabs were there because of right. They are descendants of the very people who live, who, who, descendants of the very people who lived in Palestine 
for thousands of years, even before the Jews were there. If some people come from without, with a design to occupy their country, to build a state, now where is the responsibility? Whose responsibility is it? Israel bears no responsibility for a war which it opposed, which it repeatedly yearned to end, and therefore it does not bear the responsibility for the consequences of that war, either for the suffering inflicted by the aggressor in his attack or the defender in his response. We shall do whatever we earnestly within the limits of our capacity to help alleviate the problem which this aggression has caused. In the Arab world, the rise of a non-Arab state in the heart of the Middle East was seen as a tragedy and a challenge. Stormy protests erupted all over the Arab world in Baghdad, in Aleppo in North Syria, and in Aden. The far-flung Arab world was in ferment. In three days, 80 Jews were killed in Aden and four synagogues were burned. In the old communities of Yemen and Iraq, where Jews had lived long before Muslim and Arab history had begun, the rise of a Jewish state was like the sound of a trumpet, calling them to change the direction of their lives and to join in the construction of a new society. Operation Magic Carpet, as it was called, airlifted thousands of Yemenite Jews to Israel, the last of them in September 1950. The biblical prophecy seems to be fulfilled. The Lord shall set his hand for the second time to recover the remnants of his people, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Until 1950, the attempt to emigrate from Iraq to Israel was a capital offense. Many Jews had been killed there. When the law changed, almost all the Jews applied to leave Iraq, an unfortunate 25,000 elected to remain. A rescue airlift spans the 600 miles from Baghdad to Tel Aviv to bring to safety 54,000 Jews who face a reported reign of terror in Iraq. Planes running four to six a day have been getting these refugees out at the rate of 10,000 per month. The rescue must be completed by May 31st, the deadline that Iraq has set for Jewish emigration. For these Sephardim, their arrival in Israel had profound religious meaning, but there was urgent practical demand caused by what had now become a flood of immigrants. At first, the immigrants were settled in villages evacuated by the Arabs in their flight. They made homes out of ruins. that space was quickly filled, temporary transit camps had to be thrown together, some from old military bases left by the British. On average, nearly 23,000 newcomers were now arriving every month. Even the paperwork presented an administrative challenge. Tents and huts by the thousands were erected, but at times not fast enough to accommodate the flood of immigrants. By the end of 1949, 100,000 people were living in such transit camps. The Mar Barot were primitive and crowded, flooded by winter rains, exposed to the asperity of the summer heat, and cut off from the main cities and villages. All of Israel's available resources in manpower and material were thrown into the effort to assimilate the new arrivals. The reactions of the new citizens were rewarding. The Ma Bara, or Transition Center, was a unique Israeli experiment designed to encourage immigrants to become independent as soon as they arrived. They were housed in tents or huts, 
but each family was independent in providing for itself. The government or the Jewish agency provided clinics, dispensaries, schools, unemployment agencies, and the other social services. By the end of 1952, 250,000 new Israelis were living in the Mar Barot. But the system resulted in enforced idleness, not alleviated by improvised schemes. It retarded the integration of the immigrants. The Mar Barot were also uneconomic. They placed a strain on Israel's meager financial means. New and better answers had to be found. And then, after a couple of years, not too many, we started taking people out of these transit camps and putting them in places where hopefully, we hope, that in days, months, and years to come, they'll start to be productive. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, all in all, in the whole country, we build uh, about, in the whole country, we built about 500 villages for newcomers, and during the years, about 25 new towns. Another development was the creation of extensive new housing projects next to the Mar Barot. People were thus able to move from the makeshift arrangements of the transit camps into brand new accommodations where they could forge a community. As 1949 began, every available surface was plastered with election propaganda. In January, the people of Israel went to the polls for the first time to elect a government to replace the one that had brought them from the birth of the state to the end of a victorious war. Ben Gurion's Mapai Party, the group of moderate socialists affiliated with Labour, won 46 of the 120 members of the Knesset. It was by far the biggest party in a fragmented parliament. One of the Knesset's first acts was the election of a president. Inevitably, the choice fell upon Dr. Chaim Weizmann. Although the immigrants would eventually become Israel's main economic resource, for the time being, they were Israel's major economic problem. The number of consumers had grown spectacularly. The number of producers had diminished. By the middle of 1949, Israel's fragile economy was nearing collapse. It was necessary to impose strict austerity on the country. But the rations were meager, one egg per person per week at first, later one per month. There was a tremendous hunger for protein, a vigorous black market sprang to life, and the currency began to lose its value. Smuggled dollars brought a premium rate of exchange. It was not good Zionism, but the dealers prospered. Chickens, dead or alive, became desirable out of all proportion to their appearance. Suddenly, it became necessary and possible to assume the appurtenances of the state. It was urgent to have an Israeli postal service, Israeli currency and banks, an Israeli airline, a tourist industry, and all the infrastructure and trappings of a modern state, all with a proud stamp of Israeli ownership and sovereignty. 
Another proud attribute of statehood was the exchange of ambassadors with other sovereign countries. We were honored by the arrival of plenipotentiaries from the United States, the Soviet Union, France, and other nations. Our first ambassador to the Soviet Union was no less a figure than Golda Meir. Our diplomatic representative in Poland, Yisrael Barzilai, was arriving on the scene of the most appalling suffering the Jews had experienced during the war. When the first British ambassador presented himself to our Knesset speaker in President Weizmann's absence through illness, the victory of Zionism over Ernest Bevin was complete. On March the 24th, I secured the decision of the Security Council by nine to one in favor of Israel's admission to the United Nations. Even that decision had to be fought through in committee and in the assembly. The admission of the applicant, if taken, would be the highest cons consummation of injustice, and it will draw another nail into the coffin of the United Nations. Israel is the only one of the 160 members that has had to get up and plead for its membership. Normally, you send a letter and you say you want to be a member. But I had to make speeches for nine hours and a kind of a cross-examination, like in the police court, about why we presume to think that we can be members. There's been nothing like that in the history of any other people. We look forward to Israel representing and upholding those traditions of freedom and democratic progress in the case of the applicant, such evidence is altogether lacking. The New Zealand delegation will, of course, of course, vote for the admission of Israel. After a vote of 37 to 12 for admission, with nine nations abstaining, Assembly President Herbert B. Ebat announced... And I therefore formally declare Israel admitted to membership in the United Nations. As the other members cheered, delegates of the Arab states who bitterly opposed Israel walked out. These are Lebanon, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Early in 1947, when I was a young, rather obscure, and completely anonymous Zionist official, somebody had said to me, that one year from then, you, Abba Iban, will be leading a, a Jewish delegation in the Security Council, the highest organ of international security, and pleading successfully for a ceasefire, for an end of the war, and above all, for the recognition by the world of Israel as a legitimate sovereign state. Well, I just said that's a crazy fantasy. I shall still always retain the feeling in my hands of the rope with which I put our flag on the mast, knowing that in that very moment when the flag went to the top, the status of the Jewish people in history had irreversibly changed. In America, our most powerful friend, President Truman, was running for re-election. He was not expected to win. And then it happened. The man from Missouri awoke from a refreshing sleep to learn that he'd been returned to the White House by a mandate of the people. I felt that we were rather the conscience of the free world. And that's the reason why I so promptly recognized the new state of Israel. I take the first opportunity coming on these, uh, stepping on the ground of this great capital to express my heartfelt thanks to the President of the United States and to the government of this country for all they've done in making out of Israel a reality. We took comfort from the militant and efficient way in which American Jewry was organizing itself under the somber but dynamic leadership of Abba Hillel Silver. Our supporters were not afraid to take to the streets or to the largest auditorium. Salute to Israel, American Zionist leader Dr. Abba Hillel Silver. Behind that front line are the vast spiritual and physical reserves and resources of world jewelry which has resolved 
which has resolved that it is tired of being stepped upon and will not permit itself to be stepped upon any longer. I was 33 when I became the leader of our effort in the United Nations and of our embassy in Washington. In September 1950, I presented my credentials to President Truman. Ben-Gurion and Foreign Minister Moshe Sharet wished me to develop a tradition under which an Israeli ambassador would carry weight in America and in the world, and not only in official Washington. One of my early duties as ambassador was to arrange for Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion to make his first visit to the United States. For us independence, Caught after six millions of our people have been exterminated by the Nazis. Proof once again that the cause of justice, faithfully pursued, must triumph in the end. Next stop for the Israeli premier is New York City. In a parade through its towering canyons, the leader of one of the world's newest republics is hailed by a million people. A Visiting the White House, Ben-Gurion presented President Truman with a symbol of the state that he had helped into existence. From September 1950, I was ambassador to the United States as well as to the United Nations. My first aim was to create a legal and political basis for American-Israeli cooperation and alliance. In 1951, Dean Acheson and I negotiated the eligibility of Israel for American aid and signed the first agreements of friendship and commerce. James G. McDonald, first U.S. ambassador to Israel, with former Miss America Bess Meyerson at left, and Shoshana Damari, Israeli folk singer, campaign in behalf of Israel's half-billion-dollar independent bond issue. There's a general impression that Israel is busy with only two things, politics and austerity. But when you get to Israel, you find that not politics or austerity, but production, building, new settlements, a tremendous spirit of achievement and progress dominates the whole country. The whole of Jewish history is an eternal celebration of resilience. This quality has really come to finer expression than in the manner in which Israel now created its own opportunities. We inherited an economy almost exclusively dependent on agriculture. It was imperative to exploit such natural resources as we had and to build an industrial base. We needed manufacturing plants. Above all, we needed irrigation, and so much effort and ingenuity was spent in utilizing our meager supply of water. The pipeline to the Negev caused the desert to bloom. Israel even entered the textile and automobile industries. In December 1949, the United Nations decided, though without much conviction, that it would try to establish an international authority over Jerusalem. Having turned its back on Jerusalem when the city faced famine and destruction in 1948, the United Nations belatedly claimed jurisdiction. The only effect was to bring about a resolute Israeli reaction. Ben-Gurion moved to the Knesset from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem where it took an oath never to leave that city again. The central problem in the relations between Israel and the Arab world has been the persistent attempt of uh, Arab governments to deny our legitimacy as a state. We had nourished the hope that Arab-Jewish coexistence would find its first expression in a settlement with Jordan. There was nothing of the inhuman virulence which marked the attitude of the other Arab nations toward Israel's existence. The embodiment of this hope was, of course, King Abdullah. Abdullah's ambitions had attracted the enmity of his fellow Arabs, especially the Egyptians. Abdullah, who was 69, was shot as he was going to pray at a mosque close to that famous shrine, the Mosque of Omar. 
In Egypt, the corrupt and profligate government of King Farouk was overthrown by a military coup. A bloodless revolution brought Colonel Gemad Abdul Nasser into power. King Farouk sailed to Italy for a few more years of good life. It is my earnest conviction that peace can and will be achieved in Palestine at an early date. All attempts to reach a lasting peace with the Arabs failed. They organized a boycott of Israeli goods and markets and put pressure on their own trading partners to withdraw their recognition of Israel. We had evidence that their military staffs were preparing for the next war. I felt that we must create a bipartisan American-Israeli tradition. I arranged an early meeting between Foreign Minister Moshe Sharet and President Eisenhower in Washington. The change in the leadership of the United States was a watershed for Israel. In May 1952, I spoke at a dinner honoring President Truman. I said, we do not have orders or decorations. Our material strength is small and greatly strained. We have no tradition of formality or chivalry. One thing, however, is within the power of Israel to confer. It is the gift of immortality. Those whose names are bound up with Israel's history never become forgotten. We are therefore now writing the name of President Truman on the map of our country. I'm very touched and grateful. Uh, and a little bit overwhelmed. They have a village name for me, me, but when they're talking about a statue, they want me to join George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, and Cham Weitzman, I have about to come to the conclusion that I'm not ready yet to go into a piece of marble. For the first five years, from 1948 to 1952, nothing had seemed to go wrong. Then there followed three nightmare years in which almost nothing seemed to go right. In November 1952, the first president, Chaim Weizmann, died. Through the town of Rehov at Israel came the mourners, Arabs as well as Jews. 250,000 to pass the catafalque on which the body of Chaim Weizmann lay in state. Without Truman and Weizmann, the scene was unfamiliar. More unexpectedly, Ben-Gurion resigned in 1953. Ben-Gurion was a buoyant, vigorous, pugnacious, defiant man who sent out sparks of energy in all directions. For over two decades, he had carried heavy burdens. When Ben-Gurion resigned the premiership, he made it clear that he was leaving office, but he was not leaving power. Nothing in him was exactly what it seemed. Israel would face a different future with new figures in the center of the drama. <laughs>